The Stuka, a name that brought dread and fear to hundreds of thousands as it ushered in the Second World War. With sirens shrieking, it dived to deliver death and destruction, quickly becoming a potent symbol of Blitzkrieg. Although an effective weapon of terror, the Stuka had serious design flaws. The Ju-87 Stuka had its origins in an earlier design by the Junkers company. The model K-47 was built in 1927 as a civilian aircraft at a time when Germany was prohibited from making military planes. Later it was converted to a rugged two-seat fighter with a rare gunner able to fire between its twin rudders. Over time, the K-47 developed into a prototype dive bomber. From these tests, the concept for the Stuka was to emerge. However, the Stuka was not Germany's first dive bomber. When the Nazis came to power in 1933, they quickly rearmed the Luftwaffe by transforming the Heinkel 50 and the Henschel 123 into dive bombers. The modifications to the 123 proved to be much more than just a short-term fix. This formidable biplane provided effective close support and dive bombing service across Europe until 1944. The very first Stuka produced was made in secret at the Junkers factory in Sweden. But the Stuka's introduction to service was held up by problems in development. Hermann Pohlmann, Stuka's designer, had also worked on the K-47 and he chose to adopt much of the earlier aircraft's layout, including its twin rudder tailplane. But the Ju-87's weight and diving requirements were much greater than the K-47. On the 24th of January 1936, the prototype Stuka crashed in a dive when the entire tailplane simply broke off. The crash killed the test pilot and his engineer. The accident left Pullman with little choice but to modify the tail. Accurate bobbing required diving vertically. The twin fins and rudders were simply too weak to withstand the strong forces during a dive. Pullman's solution was to change to a stronger single rudder. But this created another problem. The vertical stabilizer greatly reduced the rear gunner's field of fire. The Junkers 87 double fin layout had failed, and the tail had already gone through one major transition, which in many ways was a step backwards, at least as far as the plane's defense was concerned. Other ideas like a rudder that could slide clear in flight were tested. This at least would have left the rear gunner with an unrestricted field of fire. The final solution came when an innovative rotating rudder was developed. However, this also meant major modifications to the fuselage. The Stuka's shortcomings forced Junkers to go back to the drawing board. This time, they proposed a totally new Super Stuka with an advanced fire control system using an optical gun sight and cannons that would keep any fighter at bay. However, all this innovation would require a complete retooling of the factory and disruption of the existing production line. Well, as I, my feeling is that there were too many innovations involved in this aircraft and not very effective ones. In fact, one might say there were, there were minuses rather than pluses. Uh, they, to give the rear gunner a better field of fire by dropping the tail was a very small plus because um, there really well, it was an, an ineffective defensive situation anyway in the Stuka. Very small caliber guns uh, with one gunner in the back. To retract the undercarriage was to remove one of the main drag factors in the dive of this aircraft. And this was a, a very important factor, the fact that the undercarriage did give such drag because that did stop acceleration in the dive 
and that gives you more time for aiming, better accuracy, and altogether it's, you were removing one of the pluses and putting a minus in its place. These things have their pros and their cons, because the Stuka really, even with an open field of fire, was not very defensible. So it's a matter of weighing up pros and cons, and in this case, I believe the cons outweighed the pros, frankly. There were other considerations too. By the end of 1941, the Luftwaffe had a much stronger day fighter than the BF-109. The new fighter was the Fokker Wolf 190. The 190 was also strong enough to accurately deliver a bomb, at least in a moderate dive. Since the new fighter now shared dive bombing duties, the Stuka had to soldier on in its original form. However, it was also given a new role where it was to excel. After Germany's abortive attack against Russia, the Eastern Front became very much a tank war. With the Henschel 129, the Luftwaffe did have a specialist anti-tank plane, but there were never enough of them. The HS 129 was heavily armored to provide good pilot protection, but the aircraft was underpowered, a factor that endangered its entire mission. So Stuka's support for the anti-tank role was timely. So the Junkers JU-87 was pressed into service and became a very effective tank buster. Other jobs included transport missions where the venerable Stuka performed the duty of a communications vehicle taking staff and supplies to the front line. On the return trip, it was often used to ferry wounded soldiers in a gondola set on top of each wing. In the bitter cold of a winter on the Russian front, these converted dive bombers must have been a welcome sight, although their story is little known. Equally unknown is the role that Stukas would have played had Hitler's only aircraft carrier, the Zeppelin, ever put to sea. Experienced Luftwaffe pilots had warned that if Stukas were attacked and forced to ditch in the sea, there would be serious problems. As their fixed undercarriage hit the water, the plane was likely to cartwheel. Junker's solution was to use explosive bolts to jettison the landing gear, permitting a much safer ditching on water. The Stuka didn't just stay in service until the war ended, it also stayed in production. Over 6,500 were built before the last one was pushed off the production line, probably cobbled together from damaged or spare parts. Despite the large numbers produced, only a handful of JU-87s have been found. But the terror they created still remains seared in the minds of survivors. When he's diving steady, you, you, you see the pilot, and, and you are pretty sure that therefore he can see you as well, you see. And, and, of, and you think, oh my God, he's, 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 he, he finished me off. And he was diving at you, you had a feeling he's bound to get you. <laughs> You, you know, and all, even in the First World War, people, shall we say, fighter pilots just attack and fire machine guns at people and so on. This you can hide. You can hide behind a wall, you can hide behind a ditch, you can hide behind a tree. You can't hide from a bomb, because a bomb will destroy the wall. And it's really and truly frightening. The sight and sound of the deadly Junkers 87 Stuka dive bomber as it screams towards its target. the Stuka struck fear into the hearts of millions. 
no other warplane became so instantly recognizable, and no other warplane was a more effective instrument of precision attack. For the German commanders, it was their flying artillery. The Stuka was not solely valued for its ability to cause destruction and death. Equally important was its capacity to inspire terror into the hearts of an enemy. Hitler had used terror to seize and hold power in Germany, and no one understood better the use of terror in pursuit of invasion and conquest. The small engine Junkers monoplane was the perfect instrument of terror, and has become the most chilling and enduring image of Nazi militarism. Wherever Hitler sent his armies in Europe, Africa, Greece, the Balkans, and deep into Russia, these fearsome dive bombers were always in the forefront. It is surprising to note that although thousands were built, less than 400 of the aircraft were ever in service at any one time. Despite their relative scarcity, the Stuka was to leave an impression on World War II out of all proportion to its numbers. Soaring above the claims of more glamorous types, it's the sticker that has become synonymous with the German Luftwaffe. This is the last surviving Stuka in Western Europe. Of all of those hundreds of planes, the single machine lying peacefully at rest at the RAF Museum at Hendon is the last of its kind on the continent to which it once spelt terror for millions. The man who fought against the Stuka would recognize instantly the angular go-wing shape. Those who flew in them forever held the aircraft dear to their hearts. First flown in 1935, the Stuka were already considered obsolete by the start of the war only four years later. But their commander, General Wolfram von Richthofen, was confident that his warplanes would prove their worth. Originally one of the many opponents of the dive bomber concept, Richthofen had been deeply impressed by the lethal accuracy of a handful of dive bombers available to the German Condor Legion in the Spanish Civil War. So the strikers were given a reprieve, which was to last the whole six years of the war. The overriding advantage of the Stuka was the accuracy of its bombing run. Conventional bombers at the time released their bombs at a high altitude, aiming devices were rudimentary and accuracy was necessarily poor. Dive bombers swooped down on their targets and guided their bombs towards the target, allowing far greater accuracy. With the special dive brick supplied, the Stuka could fly so low before pulling out of its dive, it could almost place its bomb on the target, and its cranked wings allowed excellent forward vision. But there was one major disadvantage. The Stuka was very slow and cumbersome. It was almost defenseless against modern fighters such as the Spitfire or the Hurricane. Time again, this great weakness would come back to haunt the German Air Force. Even by the exacting standards normal for aerial combat, the men who flew the Stuka had to be exceptionally fit. Coming out of a drive, the two crewmen were subjected to a centrifugal force up to five times that exerted by gravity. The blood was drained from the retina and brain, usually leading to a temporary blindness and loss of consciousness. It was found that short, stocky pilots in their 30s and 40s were best able to withstand the high g-forces involved in a dive bomb attack. To combat the disastrous possibilities of crew losing consciousness, the Stuka was fitted with an automatic pull-out and bomb release mechanism, which prevented the loss of control during this critical part of dive bombing maneuvers. In other respects, the controls were surprisingly simple. Early versions had only two instruments, a compass and a turn and bank indicator. Slowed down by the fixed undercarriage, top speed was less than 250 miles an hour. The Stuka was armed with two fixed forward machine guns and a third rear-facing gun operated by the navigator who sat with his back to the direction of travel. The Stuka carried either a single 1,000 kilo bomb under the fuselage or one 500 kilo bomb plus four other smaller bombs under the wings. 
strong German forces had been assembling clandestinely on the borders of Germany and East Prussia. Hitler's surprise attack on Poland, codenamed Operation White, was about to commence, and, with it, the Second World War. Overhead, 200 fighters, 650 bombers, and over 200 Stuka flew eastwards through the dawn skies. It was three Stukas from three Stuka Geschwader 1, which dropped the first bombs of the war and Dershau. It was a Stuka of STG-2, which first shot down an enemy plane. The prime objective of the Luftwaffe was to destroy the small Polish Air Force, on the ground if possible and ordered that the Stukas and the medium bombers could carry out their deadly work unimpeded. By the end of the day, the Luftwaffe had lost 14 aircraft. The Poles had lost half of their air force. The Luftwaffe commanded supremacy in the air, and the Stukas were able to range with impunity. Attacking the Polish communications, rail and road links, supply depots, and relief columns. As the Germans advanced, they built improvised airstrips, allowing the strikers to operate from close behind the front line. All leading army units were accompanied by Luftwaffe liaison officers and direct radio contact with their aircraft. This sophisticated level of cooperation between army and air force was unique to the Germans and proved devastatingly successful. Besides the Stukas, the Germans also used a number of old Henschel HS-123 dive bomber biplanes. They knew that the harsh high-pitched snarl from the Henschel engine could also create fear amongst those on the ground. The Germans quickly found that by bombing towns and villages, the hordes of civilian refugees crowding back from the front seriously interfered with the movement of Polish forces. The object was not destruction, but terror. Warsaw was already encircled by the Germans. The Polish defenders put up a fierce but hopeless resistance. A prolonged ferocious bombardment by heavy artillery and, from the air, left buildings of the capital in ruins and the streets littered with the dead. On the 29th of September, all resistance in Warsaw ended and Poland as a state ceased to exist. A new word was added to the English language Blitzkrieg. German mastery of the powerful new technique of Blitzkrieg, Lightning War, gained Hitler a dazzling triumph, and opinion was unanimous that throughout the campaign, Richthofen Stukas had made a contribution far disproportionate to their numbers. The cost in military chance had been light. 31 aircraft lost mainly through gunfire. The victory parade was followed by a lavish distribution of medals and promotions. Göring, the Luftwaffe commander, basked in new glory. By any standards, the Luftwaffe rise from a clandestine organization in 1933 to supremacy in 1940 was a remarkable feat. Banned by the Treaty of Versailles from building warplanes in Germany, Junkers, Messerschmitt, Henkel, and Dornier had built factories abroad. The Junkers 87 was first penned in 1933 by Hermann Pullman. The distinctive inverted gull wings allowed the shortest undercarriage to reduce drag. Winning a dive bomber design competition in January 1935, the first prototype had been taken to the air in September 1935, powered ironically by a Rolls-Royce B-12 Kestrel engine. By the outbreak of war, the 87B1 boasted a 1100 HP UMO-21 engine, and the cumbersome undercarriage fairings had been replaced by lightweight spats. And in Poland, the Germans had learned the effect produced by the mere sound of a dive bomber going into attack, and the Stukas were now fitted with sirens, soon to be known as the Trumpets of Jericho. Perhaps no device in the history of warfare was so simple, yet instilled such a paralyzing fear. The high-pitched shriek unnerved even some of the Germans. It was heard above the cries of the wounded and the crash of explosions. The French troops were subjected to an ordeal beyond the limits of endurance. The Germans had established their bridgehead into France. 
With gathering momentum, the German armored spearheads dove westwards into the sea, wreaking havoc with the Allied communication and supply lines. The Stukas, operating with strong fighter protection, were again consistently to the fore, bombing, strafing, and harrying. The rapidity of the advance meant that the Stukas were flying from new, hastily constructed airstrips almost every day. Specially adapted trucks laid telephone cables at up to 20 miles per hour, keeping the new bases in touch with the headquarters. Fuel and ammunition was brought in by continual relays of Junkers' transports. Behind the Allied lines, all was confusion. The roads were choked with the fleeing, severely hampering the movement of British and French forces. Now the mere sight of the Stuka's distinctive contours was enough to create panic. Recognizing the inevitability of defeat, the British resolved to evacuate their surviving troops from France. The Stukas proved highly successful against Allied shipping, especially the smaller craft. But when the bombs fell on the beaches, sand absorbed most of that blast. As Goering attempted to obliterate the British expedition reforces on the beaches of Dunkirk for the first time, the Stukas encountered serious opposition in the air. The bulk of the RAF fighter force had been conserved for the defense of Britain. Now, squadrons of Spitfires and Hurricanes flew across the channel to intercept the German bombers on their way to and from the Dunkirk beachhead. The British fighters could only spend a short amount of time over France, but they did enough to expose the Stuka as alarmingly vulnerable, when not well escorted by Messerschmitt fighters. By the 4th of June, the evacuation was complete. For the Germans, Dunkirk was an unplanned setback, but one far eclipsed by the splendor of their shattering victory over France, which formally capitulated on the 22nd of June. In Germany, the celebrations were long and jubilant. The Stuka airmen were among the most fated of the heroes. The Stuka aces had become a glamorous new elite. Dr. Goebbels, Hitler's Minister of Propaganda, was quick to recognize the value of the Blitzkrieg victories. German citizens were held in thrall by film, vividly depicting the exploits of the Stuka squadrons and their intrepid pilots. The maker's original designation for the aircraft was the Junkers 87, and Stuka was simply an abbreviation of Sturzkampf Flugzeug, meaning dive bomber. But for friend and foe, like the name Stuka, became inexorably linked with one aircraft alone. On July the 16th, Hitler signed Führer Directive Number 16, laying down his plans for the invasion of England. The brunt of the initial flight was to be born of the Luftwaffe, which was assigned an onerous series of tasks. Among the first of these was to overwhelm British coastal defenses and to close the channel to British shipping. Later, airfields and other targets further inland were to be struck. Goring, 2nd and 3rd Air Forces were based in France and Belgium. Their main adversaries were the Hurricanes and Spitfighters of RAF Fighter Command. The Luftwaffe commanders were actually aware of the relatively short range of their fighters. The deeper into Britain they had to penetrate, the shorter the time available for combat. The commanders hoped to destroy as much as possible of the fighter command during the fighting over the channel. On the 10th of July, the channel battle began in earnest, when Stukas badly damaged two unworthy Royal Navy destroyers. Over the next weeks, the trumpets of Jericho sounded often and loud. British coastal convoys were repeatedly hit as was the destroyer base at Dover and other harbor installations. The Stuka pilots all had specific practice in attacking shipping. Judging altitude above the sea was difficult, especially when the water was smooth. The Stuka pilot, forced to ditch in the sea, faced an unpleasant dilemma. Coming down in the water, 
The fixed undercarriage pulled the aircraft nose down violently, making death almost certain. Whereas if the crew bailed out, their raft and survival equipment was left in the cockpit. The resources of Fighter Command were stretched and almost to a breaking point, and the Stuka losses were light compared to the damage they inflicted. By the end of July, the Admiralty was compelled to forbid destroyers to sail the channel by daylight. What remained of the flotillas at Dover was moved to safer bases more distant from the Germans' proposed invasion area. The Stukas had fulfilled the role for which they had been designed. But Goring then made the fateful decision to employ them as a strategic, not tactical force against inland targets. It was a role for which they were manifestly unsuited. Against Fighter Command's hurricanes and spitfires, the Stukas were at a severe disadvantage. They were inferior in speed sealing and armaments. Usually, the cockpit was without protective armor. These weaknesses were well known for the British fighter pilots. During the Battle of France, Curtis Hawks of the French Air Force had encountered a formation of Stukas attacking a French armored column and had destroyed 16 of them. Now, whenever the Stukas were caught without a strong shield of accompanying fighters, the result was invariably a massacre. The RAF pilots relished nothing better than what they called the Stuka Party. Throughout the first part of August, Stuka's losses mounted at an appealing rate. On the 19th of August, on the personal orders of Hermann Goring, the dive bombers were withdrawn from frontline operations. The Stukas were moved to Paddock Alley area to rest and regroup in preparation for the coming invasion. To Goring's intense frustration, fighter command remained unbroken, forcing the cancellation of the invasion and the Luftwaffe turned into the intensive bombing of British cities. The failure was also of grave concern to the Luftwaffe's commanders of armaments, General Ernst Uday, an ace pilot from the First World War. Uday owed his important post to Hitler's patronage. Goring had long distrusted his capabilities, and for all Uday's charms, he proved to be a poor administrator. Goring himself was idle, and the two men were ill-equipped to prepare the Luftwaffe for the challenges to come. Hitler was adamant that the war would soon be won, and with the existing weaponry. It had been Uday's admiration of the American Curtis dive bomber, which had prompted German development of a similar machine. But by 1940, the Stuka design was showing its age, and the Reich Air Agency originally intended to phase it out in early 1941. Even though the Stuka had sustained heavy losses during the Battle of Britain, by any standards, it was an undeniable success. Stukas remained in production, and although a variety of improvements were incorporated to successive versions, the basic design remained unchanged. Variations were produced to meet specific demands or conditions. A few 87B Stukas destined to work in the ice-covered fields were fitted with skis. For desert conditions, the 87BR trophies had supercharger filters. The long-range 87R version, designed primarily for use against shipping, had two extra 300-liter tanks in place of the outer wing bomb load, and it had extra radio equipment. The Stuka's achievements impressed many in the Luftwaffe, and in consequence the twin-engine Junkers 88 was adapted to operate as a dive bomber. Perhaps more remarkably, amongst other design changes, a dive bombing capability was even specified for the four-engine Henkel 177. Amongst the young German airmen, enthusiasm for the Stuka remained as strong as ever. Stuka aces, of which the most famous was Hans Urlich Rudel, became national heroes, and both men and machines were idolized. After Western Europe, the next great theater of conflict, in which the Stuka displayed its lethal preeminence, was the Mediterranean and North Africa. A strong Luftwaffe strike force, of which the Stukas formed a significant component, was transferred to Sicily and Romania in late 1940. This 10th Air Corps immediately commenced a running campaign of harassment against British convoys and warships. In a brilliantly planned and executed attack, Stukas crippled HMS Illustrious, the Royal Navy's only available aircraft carrier in the Mediterranean. 
Britain's previously assured domination of the Mediterranean was broken, and for two years, the eastern Mediterranean was effectively closed to British warships. Operations were confined to the so-called Stuka sanctuaries, areas out of reach of the aerial predators. In North Africa, Italy's entry into the war had resulted in an embarrassing series of defeats at the hands of the British and Commonwealth forces. In February 1941, General Rommel arrived in Tripoli with the first units of the African Corps. Almost immediately, Rommel took the offensive. His armed columns benefited immeasurably from the aggressive support provided by the Air Corps Africa, which included a contingent of 50 Stukas. The all-pervading desert sand presented both sides with formidable problems of aircraft maintenance. The difficulties were further compounded by the great extremities of temperature. The inevitable breakdowns often put more machines out of commission than the enemy action. Most of the area fighters were still committed to the defense of the homeland, and for the time the Luftwaffe encountered limited resistance from them. Again and again, the desert air resounded to the malevolent wail of the dive bombers as the British forces were driven back eastwards in rapid retreat. A German general commented, the British dread of the strikers is equaled only by our soldiers' love for them. The Africa Corps' surging advance left the strategic garrison port of Tobruk cut off and encircled. For weeks, repeated Stuka raids subjected the helpless defenders to a daily ordeal of terror until the British garrison finally surrendered. On the 6th of April 1941, Hitler launched a sudden invasion of Yugoslavia and Greece. 600 Luftwaffe aircraft, including two squadrons of Stukas, were deployed and air opposition was negligible. The speed with which the German forces could be moved and made operational was still far beyond Britain's capabilities. The Stukas, protected by ME-109s, parade upon villages, transport columns, railways, bridges, artillery, tanks, troops, and defenses. The cumulative effect was devastating. After 12 days of Blitzkrieg, Yugoslavia was finished. Greece lasted until the end of May. The 60,000 strong British and Commonwealth reinforcements were hurriedly evacuated to Crete which itself succumbed shortly thereafter to a dramatic airborne assault. Throughout the evacuations, the British ships were harried mercilessly from the air. The four squadrons of hurricanes were soon overwhelmed, and the Stuka has claimed the trip ships Lamat and the destroyers Diamond and Wernick. 260 died on the cruiser Orion. With Crete secure, Stukas and bombers launched a punishing aerial offensive attack against Malta. Britain's last major Mediterranean fortress, and against convoys attempting to supply the beleaguered island. With only a handful of elderly hurricanes to contend with, the Stukas with fighter support were able to bomb at will. In 1942, Malta endured 150 successive days of continuous bombing. In North Africa, the bitter struggle continued, but with the threat of invasion of Britain now lifted, RAF fighters were arriving in the desert in ever-increasing numbers, and it became too dangerous for the vulnerable Stuka to continue operations as before. The speed and distance of Rommel's advance left the Luftwaffe with huge logistical problems with fuel supplies. Many aircraft were transferred from the Mediterranean from more important work elsewhere. The Africa Corps fought on with unabated vigor, but without effective air cover, its fate was already sealed. Allied ground and air strength eventually grew overwhelmingly, and the African Air Corps was comprehensively defeated in October 1942 by Montgomery's 8th Army at the Battle of El Alamein. The final defeat of the Axis forces in Africa paved the way for the Allied invasions of Sicily and Italy. Before these events unfolded, however, Hitler's forces had been assigned a task of magnitude far exceeding anything so far attempted. Operation Barbarossa was aimed at overthrowing Stalin's Soviet Union. Germany's giant eastern neighbor had territory standing at one-sixth of the Earth's land surface. 
The vast bulk of these lay far out of the range of any of Göring's aircraft. Hitler's Directive No. 21 instructed the Luftwaffe first to eliminate the Red Air Forces and thereafter to provide ground support for the German army. For this stupendous enterprise, Hitler amassed over 3 million men, but the total number of warplanes available was somewhat less than that assigned for the campaign against France a year previously. At 3 o'clock p.m. on the morning of June the 22nd, 1941, Operation Barbarossa commenced. Stalin had ignored the warning of Hitler's intentions, and the Soviet forces were caught not only by surprise, but hopelessly ill-prepared. 70% of Soviet frontline aircraft were massed on the airfields near their frontier. Many lined up wingtip to wingtip, offering perfect targets. The Luftwaffe Stukas and bombers achieved their most extraordinary success ever. By the end of the first day, 1,811 Soviet aircraft had been destroyed, nearly all of them on the ground. Within one week, the toll had risen incredibly to over 4,000. The Germans lost only 35 planes. In Berlin, Göring refused to believe the statistics. Hitler, in his command bunker in East Prussia, received the reports from the front with mounting excitement. The land offensive was also proceeding astonishingly well. Undering the shattering impact of the German Blitzkrieg assault, the Soviet defenses were reeling in disarray. With air superiority emphatically established, the Stukas reverted once more to their well-practiced role of tactical support, screaming down to have the trade target after target, ahead of the fast-moving German armored spearheads. The landlines on which the Soviet military depended heavily for communications were also singled out for punishment. The most dramatic progress was made by the army driving from Moscow. The collaboration of tank and dive bomber was efficient and lethal as never before. The Luftwaffe liaison officers, equipped with the new HF radio, played a major part in numerous attacks. And time after time, the Stukas were called down to swing the balance in the Germans' favor. Throughout the autumn, the advance continued. The Germans took prisoners by the hundreds of thousands, and destroyed or captured immense quantities of Soviet guns and tanks, although, disturbingly, the Red Army seemed to possess inexhaustible reserves of men and machines. Although their loss rate was low, the Luftwaffe had never had to fight a campaign of such sustained duration. The combination of mechanical wear and tear with prolonged attrition began to cut deep into the fighting strength, and the sources of supply were ever lengthening. Stuka pilots had no defined tour of duty, and crews were flying six or more missions a day for weeks on end. Worse was to come. The first frosts were welcomed as the firming up ground made swampy by autumn rains. Operation Typhoon, the great final onslaught on Moscow, was able to get underway, but the temperature continued to fall. The freezing Russian winter was a certainty for which the Germans were inexcusably unprepared. The high explosive bombs no longer detonated, but merely shattered on impact. Metal buckled and snapped. Ground crew, continuously at risk of frostbite, were driven to desperate measures to keep the aircraft functioning. The engines had to be started and warmed up at least every 30 minutes. The Stuka were ordered into attack ships, and Hans Orlik Rudel succeeded in scoring a direct hit on the battleship Marat. With a new armor-piercing bomb, tailing off the bows of the 23,000-ton vessel. By his great courage, Diving faster and lower than anyone else in the force, though ferocious anti-aircraft fire, Rudel was able to add a battleship to the fantastic tally of tanks destroyed by this fearless aviator. In 1942, the major German military effort was switched to the south and the Caucasus, where Hitler hoped to cut off Stalin's supplies of oil. Although huge tracts of territory in the Crimea were taken, Greater resistance was encountered than had been anticipated. For many weeks, the Germans lay siege the great fortress of Sebastopol. Naturally, Stuckers were called upon to take part. The town itself was heavily bombarded. Eventually, Sebastopol fell, but the delay disrupted Hitler's timetable for conquest. Before many months, 
a complete and humiliating withdrawal from the Caucasus was underway. By this time, the tide of battle was running inexorably against Hitler. The fall of Stalingrad in early 1943, with the loss of an entire German army, marked a crucial and irreversible turning point in his fortunes. Yet he still commanded an enormous force in the field, and resolved that the Germans would fight a trial of strength with the Red Army. The Soviets were entrenched around the city of Kursk. In Berlin, the German general staff began planning Operation Citadel, a huge pincer attack intended to cut off the Kursk salient. By now, the Soviet commanders were well acquainted with their enemy's methods, and correctly anticipated the coming attack. Both the military and civilian population threw themselves into desperate preparations. The Germans had been increasingly alarmed at the quantity and quality of the new Soviet army. Some Stukas were therefore adapted specifically for use against tanks. One of these was flown by Hans Rudel, who now embarked on an extraordinary campaign as a tank destroyer. The Tank Buster version was equipped with two 37mm Flak 18 armor-piercing cannons slung under the wings and proved highly successful. Its distinctive appearance soon earned the nickname the Panzernacker, also known in English as the Tank Cracker. Rudel destroyed over 500 enemy tanks in his machine. Fittingly, the last surviving Stuka is also a Tank Buster although the two underwing cannons have since been lost. After some delay to allow the delivery of the latest German tanks, Operation Citadel began in early July. Hitler knew that never again would Germany be able to assemble a force on the scale deployed at Kursk. He knew, too, that his enemy was all the time growing stronger. He told his generals, My stomach churns at the thought of this battle, but I see no alternative. Impressed by the earlier achievements of the Stuka, the Soviets had successfully deployed their own dive bombers and ground attack aircraft. The strikers were frequently frustrated by the dense cloud of dust and smoke hanging over the battlefield, and by intense Soviet anti-aircraft fire. But, when the conditions allowed, the Stuka tank busters showed themselves formidably effective, claiming up to 60 Soviet machines destroyed in one day. In a single action, Rudel knocked out an entire column of 12 tanks. Yet, it was not nearly enough. The battle raged for nearly 50 days. Despite their vulnerability, the Stuka were still able to operate, being continually sent in to bolster threatened sections of the front. The Luftwaffe committed every available aircraft, however obsolete to the fray, because there was nothing else. Slowly, and at a stupendous cost, the war in the East was lost. The airmen were paying a heavy price for the complacency and misjudgments of Goring. In Italy, the Western Allies were fighting a grim, costly, and slow-moving campaign against a masterfully organized defense. The German general Kesselring was a former Luftwaffe commander, and when in January 1944, the Allies landed an amphibious force behind German lines at Anzio, Kesselring's response was swift and effective. In repeated attacks, Germans took a swoop down relentlessly, striking the Allied troops and ships. Heavy German reinforcements were quickly deployed, and the expeditionary force was very nearly driven back into the sea. And yet, the shortcomings of the German strategic planning were now laid bare. The surprise appearance was to be the last successful deployment of the Stuka. The tide had turned emphatically in favor of the Allied forces, who now enjoyed overwhelming command in the air. The airspace was virtually impenetrable to the best and fastest Luftwaffe fighters, let alone the slow and clumsy Stukas. After the D-Day landings in June 1944, Allied Typhoons and Mustangs armed with bombs, cannons, and rockets came in low and fast, homing in on targets before the defenders were aware they were under attack. 
In the three weeks of the invasion, they dropped 12,500 tons of bombs on airfields and communications alone. Three years previously, the Luftwaffe's Stukas and bombers had dealt fearful destruction on the retreating Red Army. Now, the German armies were to suffer unsparing devastation from the air in far greater measure. With the coming of 1945, the long war drew to an end, as Germany was crushed between the might of the Western Allies and the vast and ruthless Red Army. Although Nazi Germany was in its death rows, the bitter struggle went on. Short of pilots, mechanics, and planes, the Luftwaffe still flew. No more Stukas were built, and production ceased in October 1944. But the surviving aircraft, in the hands of men like Rudel, flew on still doing their duty in the face of overwhelming odds. By April 1945, the Red Army was positioned for an invasion of Germany itself. The Order and Nicer Rivers were the last barriers on the Soviet road to Berlin, under the cover of a huge artillery barrage. Soviet engineers constructed Bailey bridges across the two waterways. Against this tempting target, the last Stukas flew warily into their final battle, a desperate attempt to destroy the bridges. For the first time, the trumpets of Jericho sounded, but the mission was a failure, and the Soviet forces surged across those bridges and on to Berlin. It was the proud claim of the Stuka men that where the infantry went, so did the Stukas. And as the remnants of Hitler's forces were destroyed, the Stukas, at last, fell silent. Standing in a quiet corner of the Royal Air Force's museum at Hendon, Britain's only Stuka has a chunky, almost friendly profile. Different now, perhaps, to visualize that in the air, the distinctive cranked wing shape gave the airplane the appearance of an evil bird of prey plunging to strike its victim. Obsolete when the war began, but in the right conditions and flown by the right men, the Stuka repeatedly demonstrated that it was one of the most lethal and feared weapons in the annals of war. Music